Welcome to the episode number one of the commercial news and strategies. I am here with an amazing Nathan who will introduce himself. Nathan. Thanks, Jazz. Oh, mate. Lo- lovely to be here. Yeah, and it's amazing to have you, by the way. Thank you very much. Please tell us more about you a little bit uh, before we get on to our podcast of three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Jazz, uh, as you know, and as your audience may not be aware, I'm, I'm a finance broker, so I handle everything across from residential to commercial, specifically dealing with property investors, with the majority of them being self-employed, and a large portion of what I do is the strategy behind building multi-property portfolios. Right, so basically you are the guy to get the money from. Yes, and the great thing about what I do is I actually practice what I preach. So That's extremely amazing. active in the property investment space myself. A bit about myself, um, I am a property strategist, a commercial property strategist. What I specialize in is finding commercial and property development land, particularly just myself. I do have a team uh, who can actually do the other residential properties as well. So we obviously help people create portfolios, uh, particularly to be very, very precise, we help people create $8,000 monthly passive income in eight years. Amazing. It's the money, money, money. Yesterday, one of my team members and I were having an IG live, or Instagram live, and we were just talking about the properties and how to choose a good buyer's agent or a property strategist who can actually help you create your own portfolio. And I've got nothing against no one, to be honest. It's just that people who have not done it yet, what you're trying to achieve, I think is probably not a good strategy to work with them straight away because I don't think so they've done it. So when you've done it yourself, you have a practical knowledge of you know how to get there and how to navigate some of the stuff that's going to come through or some of the challenges that you're going to be facing. But if you've got someone on the other hand who's actually doing it uh, and helping you, I think is, is a bonus and I think is something that we ought to consider. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it's the doctor analogy, right? Do you want a doctor that's already operated on multiple patients or do you want a doctor that read a bunch of books about operating? With what we do, it's extremely dynamic. There's so many variables that come up and the only way that you can know when the variables are occurring is through the learned experience of actually going through it being there. The other thing is as well, you can also help with the emotional feelings of the person on the other side. Correct, is that because you've been through you've that. You've been through it, exactly. So I think it was last week, so we were helping a client and uh, she was putting an offer on her first commercial property ever and it's a $3 million property, so obviously a huge transaction and she was like, I'm really having cold feet. I said, I exactly know what's going on through you, you know, what's going through your mind right now, because I've been there. When I bought my first property, I only really had about $70,000 cash that I was putting as a deposit, even though I knew the deposit was going to go to the lawyer's account. Uh, and some of that was actually going to help me acquire the property because obviously I was taking a, a small portion of loan as well. Mm-hmm. It was nerve wracking in a way sure. that it was, I was having cold feet, even though I, I'm a very, confident guy and obviously don't care about money too much in a in a negative way uh, i do care about i look after money i have taken very good care of my money because of the experience that i've gained but still it was very hard for me to you know just push that button on 70k sure. because it's a lot of money right and, and it's becoming real at that particular yeah, exactly point. we can talk about these things in the theory you can look at the numbers Correct. you can see the cash flow figures at the point where you transfer that 70k over your conveyancer that's now real <laughs> and you can't back out from it exactly but th- over the years and obviously for the next three years i may have done my own property transaction at least 25 properties plus but that was the first one was always the, I, I know the hardest one. It's always the hardest one to just, you know, put that enter and just, you know, yes. put in the money and just, you know, so that you can transfer it to your conveyancer. Even though you know it's going through your conveyancer, uh, you still, you're not really confident uh, or, you know, you have cold fees as we all do. So it was very natural for her. And I said, Jen, don't worry about it. I know exactly what you feel. And she was like, hey, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling nervous. I'm like, look, I understand exactly. So I think these are, well, this is just an one example, right? That we, we are sharing right now that because we've been through the journey and 
the number of properties that I've just done on my by myself is is 25 plus. But at the same time, we've had not thousands. I would say many, 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 almost if not thousands. Yeah. So it's the confidence that we get. It's the process that we've been through so many times. Sometimes it's just like, oh right, it's too easy, you know, for for us. But but for people who've who've not done it or they're doing it for the first time, I think it's uh, it's very different. So Jazz, walk me through, what are some of the trends that you're noticing with commercial property across Australia at the moment? So commercial property right now, commercial property market is extremely tight right now uh, because of the low level stock that we have, we don't have much stock. Every property that we're trying to get through uh, obviously has got competition, but because of the leverage that we have on some of the people some of the people uh in the industry we are able to obviously get through that property but overall the market is extremely strong uh the stock is uh, like really low i was having a chat with a guy yesterday he's been in the industry for like 19 years adrian is the name of the guy in queensland he is a commercial property broker and we were finding a property and he's got a property and we were just doing some numbers about the property of that particular property. It was a warehouse in Queensland that was, I think, about 2.2 million. And and I was talking, hey, man, we were just working out the numbers and the yields were about 5% net, 5.2%. And he said the, the vendor, the seller, was not budging on price at all. Mm-hmm. He was like, either take it or you leave it. I said, 5.2%? He said, yeah, man. He said, one of the properties nearby... Uh, was sold not long ago and that was sold less than 5% net yield. These are the numbers that I don't want to see because ideally you want to have at least 5.5% of net cash flow, net yield on a commercial property to have a good returns for sure. And we don't like to go anything less than 5.5%, just just our own criteria that we have created within the company, that 5.5, We if there's anything less than that, we're not even talking about that particular... And that's largely based on the fact that you're looking for something that's going to be either neutral or cash flow positive once your Correct. clients put their Absolutely. deposit in. So as soon as you have 20% deposit or ideally 30% deposit, the cash flow is going to be absolutely amazing from day one. We bought a property for a client, which was for $1.45 million. They had about 30% deposit. The The cash flow, if I'm not mistaken, was about close to $97,000. And because they had deposited about 30%, what well, they had done 30% deposit, their cash flow was close to about $33,000 from first year. Mm. And... In in order for you to receive, achieve that in residential, you're going to be able to have to do a lot of properties and the cash flow has to be close to around 10 to 11% to be able to actually make it to that level. So that's what we're still seeing. It's extremely tight out there. Uh, the stock's still very low. That's why we have actually started to buy in New Zealand now. Okay. Uh, so how would that work from a, a financing perspective? For yeah, someone? financing. That's a great question because obviously, you know, it's an amazing question. So from the financing perspective, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to take your health. Uh, why? Because if you have a deposit and you've got a PAYG or a business that's been going on in Australia, uh, there are lenders out in New Zealand who would be more than happy to lend you money uh, for the remaining of the lend that you need so basically the ideal lvr there is about 70 percent gotcha so just so i'm understanding you've got a new zealand property purchase you've got an australian citizen slash australian Correct. permanent resident and they can actually borrow 70 maybe 80 percent in some cases some cases it's going to be very tight but it will very likely be a non-bank lender okay well, so so 70 i guess would be the safe option 70 would be a safe option is yeah. what someone can and the verification of the income will be based on their australian income. correct so based on australian same same criteria same way that you run servicing same way that you take on their expenses it's exactly the same thing it's just that that a new zealand lender will be basically lending the 70 percent of the money Gotcha. And I assume from what you said earlier about the yield, so that's one of the main drives. That is the main drive because uh, unfortunately, New Zealand is a shit show right now, uh, especially because of the market's been, 
on a per capita basis, they have been in recession for the last 18 months. So because they've had a decent amount of uh, immigration as we had too, uh, that's why they're doing extremely well, but otherwise um, it's not looking really good. And because of that, the amount of options that you get or you are getting right there right now is just absolutely amazing. So that's why we have gone to New Zealand and obviously my background in New Zealand and I've still got developments there. Mm -hmm. uh, it just gives me edge over most of the buyers agents that we have and again they can obviously learn as much as they want but i just have all the connections i can make a couple of phone calls and i can get the deal done very quickly which is great so it's really you're giving more than one option to your clients if they only want to purchase something that's located in australia fine here are the options that are available and you're going to look for a yield around the you're saying the nets are around the five 5.2 5 5 and new zealand 5. is actually higher and exactly well that was my next question what are the type of yields that you're generally looking at? Over I was working on a property and we could get the deal done at about 7%, which, which is amazing. Which even on 100% lending, that'd be cash flow positive. Uh, no, this is something that I was about to cover that. In New Zealand, the interest rates are just a touch higher. Okay. So they are looking at 7.8% is the commercial sort of loan interest rate is going to be. But... If you do my 30% deposit on, a, on on that kind of property, your cash flow is going to be absolutely amazing. Sure. Because 7%, 7.8%, and you've already got the deposit. But here's a punchline, brother. No stamp duty. No stamp duty at no all? No stamp duty at all. What about selling it for a profit? Is no there... problem whatsoever. No capital gain tax. So no stamp duty no capital gain tax. Nothing. Which would make it a much easier asset to trade. You could get in, you could 100%. get out. 100%. Now, that's something that I'd really want our Australian lovely people to understand. No stamp duty. Uh, you, you can save anywhere from 50 to 80K depending on how big the property you're buying. Because if you look at a property in Australia, it's different in every single state. Correct. If you look at it, Victoria, it sits around 5.5%. So if you're buying something for a million dollars, it's 55000 If you head over to Queensland, you're going to pay closer to $40,000, $45,000. It's across no there, just stamp wiped duty. off. It's just free. wiped off completely. Have fun, buy properties. So, Jazz, we've been talking a lot about properties, commercial properties. But commercial properties has so many different subclasses. So generally, what would you say would meet a good type of property to invest in for your clients? So look, ideally, we want to buy industrial class assets for our clients. Industrial class? So yeah, industrial um, warehouses, mm -hmm. freehold if we can, and also at the same time, some small shopping complexes. Okay. Um, someone with a great retailer like Repco, uh, could be Bunnings, could be Warehouse, could be any of those massive companies. We don't mind doing that. We don't shy away from retail, but we we be very very careful when when it comes to investing in in retail. So that's something that we're very very. Oh God. Yeah, we, we remember we start that one again, and yeah, we, and we'll just go straight to the point, yeah, just and then the, it'll lead into office. But try and keep the answer like great. punchy, yeah. Just uh, what I'll do is just cut the retail part, yeah, yeah, okay. So we take extremely good care when it comes to retail, and we're very cautious. Uh, but office spaces, we are the extremely cautious, okay. So, so talk to me about that. What is it about office spaces that makes you more cautious? So, after pandemic you know office space in melbourne is doing not really well okay because you've still got the hybrid model you've got people that are on work from home and what's going on is because of that the the occupancy rate is low when it comes to office space in melbourne city and there are talks going on right now that some of the office buildings that we see in the city may get turnaround to apartment buildings as well. So retrofitted to Correct. residential securities yes. from commercial. That may be a possibility because the office market right now is not doing really well. On the other hand, Brisbane is doing extremely well. 
So it also comes down to the city as well and the policies that they are offering or the po policies that they have in place. And Melbourne right now is saying, hey, don't worry about it. Work from home, hybrid, that's fine. So there's no hard and fast rule, particularly when no, you look at no. the strategy. It's about the, the right type of security Correct. for the actual location. And the location as well. Sydney is still very tight. Uh, Sydney market is still tight. The office space is doing good. It's just some cities who are not doing particularly well in the office space. And unfortunately, Melbourne is one of those where we live. So tell me this, when it comes to financing, what do most of the people get or do wrong or get it wrong when they're trying to buy the first investment property? Okay, so if we're assuming you own a home at the moment, the typical bank formula used to be that you would you'd have a home, home's got equity in it, we know that, it might be worth a million dollars, you may only owe four or 500,000, heaps of equity there. Typically what the bank would do if you went to them for your next loan is they will give you a loan for an investment property, but they'll tie the two properties together. It's called cross collateralization or cross securitization. Now the downside to that is now your investment property is completely tied to your home, plus the debt from the investment is effectively sitting onto your home as well. So there's a really simple and easy way to do this. In that same example where they've got that available equity, we actually take out 20% deposit plus costs. It'll roughly be about 25% for the next investment property. That'll give us two benefits. One, we no longer have the debt tied against each other, but two, we're also able to avoid lenders mortgage insurance because we're keeping the loan to under 80% on the investment property. The really good part about this as well is as the investment property goes up over time, that 20% deposit plus costs, we can actually either A, shift it onto the investment property, so all the debt sitting there, or we can use that investment property to take equity out and use that to get into our next property. That's the ideal way to do it because you don't wanna cr cross collateralize your properties. If shit hits the fan and you know, you're know you not able to do something with your investment property, you're not being able to make repayments, you actually lose your owner occupied or your primary residence as well. So part of the strategy that we do is, man, we do advise them as well uh, in a way, hey, you wanna make sure that you, you're not, not cross collateralization uh, going on when it comes to your properties. Uh, at the same time, it's easier to get lending as well, as you would obviously, you're the expert here, you know way better. It's easier to get a, a lending because you don't really have one bank dictating and saying, you know what, no, we're not gonna give you the money. Well, it, it gives you flexibility. Correct. So when, when you take equity out of your primary place of residence, for example, to get your investment property, you don't need to go to the same bank Correct. to get loan number two for your first investment. So call that property two investment property one. However, if you're cross collateralizing, you're, you're stuck with one bank and that's tied together. I've seen people with five, six, seven, eight properties that are all tied together. At that particular point, you don't have much control. And even if you were to look to sell one of them, they actually have to revalue the entire portfolio across the board. So it's about giving you flexibility and giving you lending options that'll allow you to, as you decide to build your portfolio, it'll give you options to use different banks if that's the most appropriate option for you. I think that's the best thing that you can do for you and your family uh, for the simple reason that you want to make sure that you're not putting your house at the same uh, with the same bank you have investment properties ideally. Uh, so I had in uh, sorry I had primary residence for like six months and I made sure that primary residence is with the s number seventh bank so that you know uh, no one can touch it and no one knows about it. It's just very different to all my other investment properties and that's it. So we left after six months because of that was a strategy that we, you know, we had in place anyways, yeah. The, what we basically do, and I was talking to a very interesting guy yesterday who was in change management in one of the networking events that I was there uh, early morning yesterday. And he mentioned something really interesting and I agree with it. And I can, I, I will give you the stats to match that as well. There's only about 15% of the people who are early adopters and leaders. Okay. And he said 15% of the people are the ones who's going to just accept change straight away and be like, you know, let's do it. But the, there are about 13% of the people who are negative, who will only complain and would not change, 
would not budge and we're just trying to work against the company having getting paid from the company so and the rest of them are obviously followers that's how i think the universe works as well so the point that i'm trying to make is that most of the people go to the market and we were talking about townswell yesterday as well mm -hmm. I gave the example on the IG Live. I said, most of the people still want to invest in Townsville, but the early adopters or people who move fast, they've already moved away from Townsville to the next Townsville. But because you or some of, the, some of us would only really share the data with our friends when they have made a little bit of money. Well, there's a delay. There's a lag. Exactly. It's, it's like chasing after a race car on your feet. That's exactly what you, I mean. You, you'll never catch it. You'll then. never catch it, bro. So, interest rates uh, in New Zealand, there's, there's the first cut, by the way. It just happened. 25 basis point a few days ago. So, what does that tell me? It's always, it's, it's only one way from here then that's going up. Okay. Because the, when the interest rate's going to get dropped, well, the asset value is going to go back again the way it was. So, we don't like to go and buy in Townsville when everybody's buying in Townsville. We want to go buy when there's a next Townsville, or there's the, when there's a next Caroline Springs uh, that I was talking to that guy yesterday. So that's what we like to do rather than just sticking to on and get the lag. You know, we don't want to do that. Sure. And because property works in cycles, it, it makes sense that if an area has had limited growth, that the next thing it's going to be due for some point in the future. And also the important thing, which I think is a, a core part of your business, you're not necessarily trying to time it perfectly. No. It's about getting that good quality asset, holding on to it for that period of time, Absolutely. and then just letting the market do what it's naturally going to do. It, look, man, uh, all we really need to understand is cycles, and there's a great book from Ray Dalio. I think we've talked about this before as well. Uh, Principles for Dealing with Changing World Order. In that particular book, this guy has mentioned of and has shown us cycles from 1500 up until very recently, I think up until 2019 or 2020. What that basically tells is there's always, a, everything's going to go up and come down. Sure. Time in the market is way more important than trying to time the market. And right now, what it tells me is, and I've been yelling, you can go back to my Instagram uh, videos and say, I've been telling since February uh, when RBA did not raise their interest rate. I said, this is ex extremely amazing time to buy. If you've got money, there's only one way. If they're not raising interest rate, that means it's the start of the new cycle or it's going to be about to start a new cycle. And when you buy at the start of the cycle, that's when you make the money, man. Sure. Like, don't try to get on the high that you already have or, you know, go, go and try and figure out the next towns will... Make sure that you find the next challenge will is what our job is and what we like to do. And the guy that I'm talking to you about, about 950 that we are buying a property for, I actually advised him to buy a commercial property because he had a decent budget. He was like, man, we're not sure. Sure. And after giving them like a week to think about and obviously touching base with them every two to three days if they have any question about commercial i thought you know what uh he said nah brother we're still gonna go residential we're just not confident enough and obviously they could have done way better in terms of the money that they're investing uh, but yeah they said hey we want to stick to residential i'm like no worries at all and that's partly obviously one of the motiva motivations uh about doing this podcast is just to make sure that with the commercial information and the commercial property information and the commercial investing information is out there for people to make the right decision. No, no, my, my question, I guess, is, so we're talking about commercial in that sense. Yep. Uh, I've heard as well, and, and I know you've uh, been a big advocate for this, that commercial, there's a lot more ways that you can increase the value of the asset simply on the back of the rental itself being increased with market. Whereas with residential, the value is generally tied to what the, what the market comparable sales are in the market. If you could just go. Yeah, that's that. an amazing point as well. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of gray area is what I like to call that in a commercial. Okay. In terms of finance as well and in terms of increasing the value too. Like in residential, it's going to be very hard for you to increase the value until, unless you 
oh sorry you can't increase the rent straight away until unless the the market dictates it sure if there's a lot of availability in terms of the the rentals that we already have in that suburb the the the, the rental income is not going to go up but in in commercial is the beauty of commercial is let's just say you bought a million dollar warehouse right it's a warehouse and the current rental is i'm just making up numbers this is seventy thousand dollars okay. obviously this is sixty thousand dollars six percent right okay the easiest way for you to be able to increase that rent is all you got to do is you got to be able to uh sorry increase the value of the uh, asset is just to increase the rent and the easiest way to do is we ask people just put solar panels okay we just ask our investors to put solar panels and then we actually go ahead and talk to the tenants who are leasing the property to renegotiate the lease because they're going to get the benefit of solar panels and the value of the property has gone up. Uh, sorry, the rental has gone up. The property of the va- the value of the property goes up s- straight away because it's got the direct uh, proposed well direct correlation of the increase in rental or mm-hmm. lease, whatever you want to call it, to the value of the property because when the valuers go out to value the property in commercial they look at what is the commercial lease or the lease that they're getting on that asset. And then the, that drives the uh, the value of the property as well. So that's a really quick and easy win. So Correct. you put solar panels on, that might cost you ten, fifteen thousand $15,000. Depending on, yeah, whatever it is, yeah. 20, say 20,000. 20, yeah, yeah. But if you were to get $5,000 more rental, what would that roughly equate to? So a- that's uh, you basically doing a, at least 6%. Six, five, to thirty. You're pretty much getting the almost so about sixteen times uh, so, the money. Yeah. So if you fifteen grand, twenty grand for solar panels, five grand more rental annually, you've now added eighty thousand dollars of value to the property straight away, just like that. Just like that. And for you to be able to do it in residential, good luck. People with about three plus properties, they ought to really consider what they're doing with their strategies and really look at their existing portfolio as well. That's interesting because what I've noticed as a broker with my residential clients is three properties is where the majority of people, if they bought them in relatively quick succession, they actually start to max out. Because you you talk about yields, you might be getting, we're seeing for most people, gross yields of four and a half to 5%. Parts of Brisbane, it's a little bit higher at the moment, particularly on the back of the uh, the growth in parts of Western Australia as well. However, as a general rule, you're going to net about three and a half percent. You're paying six and a half percent for your money. Sometimes less as well, yeah. Exactly, and you're paying six and a half percent for your money. Now, if we know that the average Australian income, if you've got two people, average Australian income is just shy of a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, you're going to run out of cash flow to be able to pay for those properties until you've had the growth in the rents, which could take three, five, seven, eight years. So if someone goes out and buys two or three in rapid succession, in most cases, their cash flow is gone, but also their borrowing capacity from the bank is almost entirely maxed out. Rent vesting is a really interesting topic and uh, we've written a lot about it. We've spoken a lot about it. What we've noticed is that there are particular states where it's more popular. Correct. Uh, if you take someone that's in Sydney, 70, 80, 90, even $100,000 income, even if they start looking one and a half hours out from the city, unless they're looking at a very, very small apartment, in most cases, they're completely removed from being able to enter the residential market. Uh, the other thing is as well, a lot of people will spend all of their money on the dream home, which is great, but it'll be at the loss of their ability to invest. So they'll be left with this one asset. And yes, the asset's going up in value. That's good. We always want a a property to go up in value. If it's the primary place of residence, and that's where you're going to live for 20, 30, 40 years, its growth doesn't make anywhere near the same benefit. Yes, you can take the equity out as your income increases. We know that. But you're going to always need to live somewhere. Whereas investment properties, the growth from those can be used for a couple of things. It can be used to pay down primary place of residence debt it can be used to tap the equity to go again and that's when i i really really want people to really focus about sequencing Mm. right sequencing in your life to do stuff is amazing so what do i mean by that i'm never i never say don't buy your own home right all i say is rent westing rent westing rent westing because it's a strategy that you can apply right now buy your house guys I'm not saying no. My slogan is 
buy at least five properties before you even start to think about your own home. Okay. Why? Because by then you've you've become so smart and you know, you know what? I can actually buy one more and then I can buy it because I have all this cash flow and all you have to do is delay the gratification. And you'll be able to buy a better house, you'll be able to buy a dream house because um, I was talking to a client, a potential client who's from the US. So for him, buyer's agents are very common because it's uh, it's a very old industry when it comes to... Um, for both the selling component and, and also the, and the, the buying, buying exactly. So he was talking to me and he was like, man, I want to buy this property. This is my budget. 1.2 was the budget and he was want to buy around Mount Waverly and Glen Waverly. I was like, man, you're probably going to have a very hard time buying in those areas. But I've got a question for you. I said, tell me this. How long are you going to be living in this house? And he said, oh, we're probably going to be living about four years at the very max. I said, great, thank you. If that is the case, you ought to consider buying this property from the investment perspective. What does that mean? And he said, what does that mean? I said, look, right now, when I asked him a few questions, he was like, just give me 400 square meter land. And all I really want is double story house, four bedroom is what I want. I said, what you got to do is, mate, you need to really look at from the investment perspective that you go for a bigger land. If the house is three bedroom as well, it's still okay because it will still cater their family. Mm-hmm. They can still live there for the next four years. But once they're moving out of the property, what they can do is they can develop that property in and put maybe three, four, whatever townhouses they want to put. Because obviously they're looking to buy in a, in a good area around, obviously they're not going to be able to buy anything in Mount and Glen Waverly, but Rosewell, which is uh, very close to one of those areas, they will still be able to do that. So when people really look to buy their owner occupied, the point that I was trying to make is that they ought to consider asking them a question, can I live here for 10 years or not? Sure. And, and that's interesting because the majority of people, we're so busy we have so many different things on, we're so reactive that it's very rare that you actually sit down and say, what is the purpose behind doing this? Most people will buy a home and you go, why are you buying a home to live in? Because that's what people do. And then when you talk to them and you say, well, hang on a second from what you're saying, it may be better to look at an investment property and renting in the area that you wanna live. If someone was young and in their 20s, they most likely wanna live right near their work, which is often in the inner in the suburbs. City, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it might be in the city areas. There's nothing wrong with a city apartment. They do go up in value over time. However, if any of the data is anything to go by, they don't go up anywhere near as much. And as the actual costs, correct, right? The body corporate costs, the that strata, costs that the strata, whole line. that can be quite expensive and that can really eat into your income. At the same time, people are often making decisions that they think are for the next 30 years. However, it's actually for four years. And what they'll often do is they'll go out and they'll sell that $1.2 million home. And now they've had to pay 5.5% stamp duty going in. They've got to pay an agent 2% going out. There's a lot of cash that's just evaporated in that process. I don't blame people for doing this either. Uh, Partly the narrative has been so strong uh, in all the Western countries, in Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada, USA, the Australian dream is to buy a home. The New Zealand dream is to buy a home. The American dream is to buy a home. The Canadian dream is to buy a home. So they've been fed this bullshit, if I want to call it. Now, what they really need to understand, first of all, before even they go out and buy a property, is they need to understand debt. Okay. How does that work? Right? So if someone's taken a loan for today, for 30 years, that debt is losing its value as well. So if you've taken a loan for $100 today, it's going to be close to $97 the next year. You're talking about because of the fact that inflation and money losing value. The inflation, number one, and the the printing that we do, and we just print and print and print, um, and I often use this uh, example, your coffee is not getting expensive, it's the value of the money is you're losing the value of the money is what we are losing. So the coffee is not getting expensive. It's the value of the money is, is getting lost and inflation is eating it up. 
So if we just understand debt as of how that works and really understand the debt, if I take $100 today, it's going to be 97 tomorrow. That's how you're going to look at it. That's one thing. The other bit which you can do is you can obviously offset a lot of your expenses and taxes as well and you can minimize it legally as well if you've got an investment property. But what happens is if you don't have an investment property, all you really have is an owner-occupied and all you really do is you pay off as much as possible on that owner-occupied, you're still paying all the taxes and you will have no legal way to minimize it or to help yourself You know, put some money back into your pocket. We really need to understand the debt, how that works. And I think that will be a great start for people to really rethink about what they want to do and how they want to really put in their money, whether they want to just pay off the owner-occupant as soon as possible, or you know, it's better for, for them to buy an investment property, which is a neutral sort of cash flow. They can still offset a lot of expenses. They can claim it against their uh, incomes as well. I think that's probably a smarter way to do it. That's for the people who've got the owner-occupied properties already. But for people who does not have, uh, who, who do not have any of the owner occupied, and all they're doing is just thinking, it's my humble request to really think about what you're about to do. If you are in a position to buy a property, make sure you buy an investment property first, or really at least understand the concept how rent vesting works. Uh, once you really understand how it works things going to be extremely different and yes you will get the opportunity to buy your own home but it's just going to be a bit further down the road and by then you'll have two things number one you'll have your dream home but it could be a possibility that your uh, investment properties may be paying for some of that and if you don't want to go to work 40 hours you can minimize your hours you can you can cut your hours to maybe let's say 30 hours and you can still have the income coming in whether you work or not because you're only going to get rich when your money is working when you're sleeping. The absolute biggest mistake that I made when I started my property investment journey is I started to pay my primary place of residence off faster. So I thought I was doing the right thing. I was putting additional money every single week, every single month, and I was absolutely smashing out the mortgage. The thing is, over the next three years, I paid off the majority of my home, and what I missed out was the growth in the real estate market. I then started investing in properties once I had paid off the majority of the home, but had I have gone the other way, had I have actually put my cash into investment properties rather than paying off the primary mortgage, the compounded growth that I would have got would have been significantly higher. But is that good or is that shitty? Do you want it again? It's good. No, it's good. It's good? Okay. How do you choose a good mortgage broker? So with a good broker, it goes back to you want someone that has experience in doing what you're looking at doing. So if you're a first home buyer that is looking to buy a first home with a low deposit, you would want to go to a broker that specializes in first home buyer home loans. At the same time, if you're a property investor, you would want to work with someone who A, invests in property themselves and B, specializes in that field. So like anything, there's always specialists. How do you find out what someone actually does or what they specialize? One of the greatest ways is generally an introduction from your circle of friends. They often say, how do you choose a good broker? Well, it's similar to how you choose a brain surgeon. You're not necessarily going to look up Google reviews uh, and find out, but you will look to people that have actually spoken to someone and then you have a conversation with them and find out whether or not they match and whether or not their goal and vision matches with yours. What are some of the things that people would want to do or should prepare themselves from now if they are looking to get a commercial loan? Like the top three things. What would be those three things? Sure. I, preparing for a commercial loan would be the same as what you would be preparing for any loan. The number one thing is have the conversation with the broker and get an idea on what it is that you can actually afford to purchase. Before you sign anything, before you look for any properties, before you engage anyone to find a property for you, you want to know what is the approximate range that you can actually spend because from there you can give them the best possible data so they can go out and find that property for you. Once you've got that tied in, it would be a matter of going through the pre-approval process. 
Unless you had a really large deposit and an extremely high income, which very few people fall into both of those categories, we would always advocate to do some form of financial preparation and ensure that a lender wants to work with you or is likely to be able to lend you the money should you take on the loan. How long do a how long does someone need to be able to get you to give them a figure that they can afford? Let's just say I come to you today, Nathan, I've got a property, man, I'm looking to buy, but I only really have a few days. Can you tell me uh, what can I afford? You can work out an approximate figure for someone once you've got the information. It's much easier to work these figures out if someone's PAYG and they've got a set wage, there's no overtime, and it's very straightforward. With those, often the figures can be put into a calculator. When we start looking down the uh, space of someone that's self-employed, where they may have a variance it's complicated, in their income. Yeah. Well, there's, there's additional data points of that course. they've got. There's things inside a tax return, which to be frank, even with someone that works in this space, I couldn't tell you all of the areas within my own company tax return, but you'll see things, you'll have depreciation there. There may be asset loans within it. Some banks will exclude them. Some banks will include them when it comes to servicing. The depreciation, some will add back all of it. Some will add back a portion of it. You may have had an increase in profit. So. In the most recent financial year, your profit may have been 300,000, but the year before it may have been 100,000. There are some banks that will take the average of the two and call it 200,000. There are some that will only allow you to add 60% and call it 160, even though you're earning 300. And then there are other banks that will take that final year's figure, provided you can show that that's ongoing income that's gonna be earned, they'll actually allow you to use the full 300,000. Yeah, income. because it gets complicated with the self-employed or the business there's, because there, of There's the additional friction. And law, so yeah. for those with that type of a loan, you'd wanna be having a couple of weeks notice. You wouldn't wanna be coming to me on a Tuesday saying, I'm going to go to an auction on tomorrow. Saturday afternoon or tomorrow. You'd want more time with that. What are some of the challenges that you face when, let's just say, if you have 20% deposit, can you still make it work? Depends on the size. In, in that case, you'd often, if you've got a smaller deposit, you'd most likely look at something that was a little bit smaller. You might look at a two or three oh, option rather yeah. than looking at the four. four. Yeah, definitely. And, and those will sometimes meet major bank criteria. Oh, really? Okay. So what's the maximum amount, well, what's the maximum number of townhouses what a major would look at it without really going, yeah, you know what? Yeah, and we know where to do it. Yeah, sure. So with two, you're going to have plenty of options up your sleeve okay. uh, amongst the five big banks that we've already discussed. Sure. Uh, with three, it starts to get a little bit smaller and it'll sometimes depend on, again, case by case basis. The good thing when you are going down the two, you can get your lending to 80 and in some cases even above 80% for the property. So for someone with that smaller deposit, it might make sense to start something smaller and then build their way up. What about the commercial development? Does that apply to that as well or is it just residential are we talking here? We've got the option with all of the major banks, they have both a resi and commercial division. There's often a fair overlap between the policies between the two. The commercial division will tend to be a little bit more flexible with the criteria, depending on how the deal The gray goes. area. <laughs> Open-minded is probably my preferred phrase. Open-minded open it is, okay. Because they can make a more commercial decision and there may be an exit strategy. So again, using your example of selling, uh, developing three, four commercial warehouses slash townhouses in this particular case, if you can show that you can get pre-sales or you've got sufficient equity that sits across there, a bank will be more open to lend to you. Why is residential development timeframes are better than commercial? Generally speaking, so of course, generally speaking, uh, residential will generally be faster as long as the lending can go through a residential channel because particularly for bank uh, brokers that have high volume lending with banks. So for us, for example, with most of the banks we have their highest tier possible under the residential side of things, which means that we're talking about same day or 24 to 48 hours, they're picking up the file and they're looking at it. And that's consistent all the way throughout the year. Whereas with commercial, it'll largely depend, because it's specialized, because there's more thinking that's involved, there's less bank assessors that are physically sitting that are available. So if they've got 
someone that's on holidays, they may have had an in influx of applications that have come through in the last week. It's going to be a little bit slower and the process can be a little bit slower across from there. It doesn't mean that it won't happen. It just means that it, the time frame that it'll happen in can be stretched out. Whereas a standard residential, as long as it ticks the boxes, it'll just fly through. Why become a mortgage broker and try and help people create portfolios? Sure. Well, I mean, to give you a bit of a background and a nice story, uh, when my parents were extremely young, we actually lost our first home. Uh, so as eight or nine years old, uh, the you know, to a shortened version would be that the repayments weren't met and we lived in rentals for a very large portion of my childhood. And like anything, when you go through that as a background and you see all of the wasted money that goes the whole way through, and we, um, my father wasn't a homeowner for the majority of my childhood. And then at the same time, parents separated. Mum, on the other hand, had a new partner and she bought a few properties. By the time she was in her late 50s, she was in a position where she didn't have to work. Uh, she was starting to work more because she wanted to work as opposed to needing to work. And I saw the lifestyle difference that occurred through multi-property ownership. So for me, it's about educating people as much as possible, showing them how they can use the, the income because we're all working hard. We're all working 40, 50, 60 hour weeks in our jobs. But for most people, it's just going. They've got taxes, they've got mortgage repayments, they've got groceries, general living costs, maybe one holiday a year. At the end, if you're lucky, you've got a little bit left in your superannuation. By educating people on how they can use their equity in their home, how they can actually borrow and purchase properties, it changes lives. I had a client that contacted me uh, we'd spoken to them a couple of years ago and we'd organized their second property purchase. And at the time, it required a little bit of work to be able to get her into her second property from a lending perspective. The first bank wasn't happy with it. We were able to find a solution. We were able to get some equity out of the mother's home and we were able to get her into a second property. Now, that property was located in Perth. Since then, the property's grown by a quarter of a million dollars and her income also grew because she had a young child who's now old, older rather, sitting in primary school and you look that conversation that I had with her changed their family's financial position by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now she had to walk straight into a bank which is what she did before we were introduced to her. She would have just sold the property and bought the other one so she would have still had one home, she would have had some equity growth. So it's things like that where we can actually make a meaningful impact in people's lives just through giving them better advice. It's why I do what I do and it's why I love what I do. Uh, the second reason is I absolutely love property jazz. I love purchasing it. I love watching how it grows and I, I love building the portfolios. And I get that same level of joy when I actually see other people's portfolios grow as well. So Jazz, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier about your uh, suggestion for most people is that if they have the opportunity starting from day one, haven't bought any property yet, they should rent vest. If someone already owns a property in your mind, is that an asset? Or is that a liability? Sell it. <laughs> it's a liability. I'm just kidding. Oh, look, uh, yes, ideally, I really want to understand their full well, situation first before I really tell them what to do, what not to do. The reason for that is there are some people who have had their uh, honor occupied for a long, long time. And when you've had that property for a decent amount of years, you must have paid off a decent amount of uh, uh, mortgage plus at the same time you must have gained a lot of growth or a lot of you know maybe a few hundred thousands on on that property now the best thing that we really need to understand is or the the thing that we really need to understand is what are they trying to achieve and why are they doing it so in in my opinion still owner occupied or primary residence is still a liability, right? I think it becomes an asset when you have multiple properties and the incomes from other properties are, you know, flowing through to your owner occupied or primary residence, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think. So in my eyes, I think it's still a liability. I still don't have it. Yes, I do want to buy it and I will buy it, but when I know the time is right or I have enough income 
from the other properties that I have, which is going to pay off my primary residence rather than me putting my heart and money and, and just paying that off. So can you just walk me through what would generally meet an investment grade property as opposed to an owner occupied property? Is there a sweet spot in 2024 in August that someone should be looking at for a good quality investment grade property? Yeah, look, the value is in the land. Okay. We really need to understand that. And I want to do, I do want to answer that question that you've mentioned that uh, in the strange time of COVID, the building costs went through the roof. The reason for that was because we were printing money like there was no tomorrow. Okay. We were getting drunk on free money, is how I like to put it. And when you print so much money, all you really do is you want to put that money somewhere as soon as humanly possible because, and ideally real estate or properties because the asset value is going to go through the roof and you print a lot of money. So that's why we, the building material went through the roof because the demand was so much that they had no other option just to push it. And because the demand was massive, hence that went through the roof. For someone to be able to really understand in August 2024 what's a good investment grade property, I think you ought to consider buying a property with a land which you can actually add some value to in the future. That, in my opinion, is a great investment property. Or you can also obviously ought to consider commercial. The difference between the top one in property investors and, and the rest of it is just because they've been very, very strategic about what they're going to do. And they have already thought about their next five moves that they have in mind. Okay, this is what I want to do. Okay, I want to buy this investment property. Okay, I'll redo this and I'll buy another one and I'll do that and I'll probably repeat the process. They have a very clear strategy of how they're going to do, do it. So this is something that we share with our clients once they come on board and they have a very clear mindset of what they're trying to achieve. So the first couple of questions that we ask is, hey, a couple of questions that I want you to think about it. You know, an introduction call will be made either by myself or one of my team members. And what they will do is they want them to think about a couple of questions before I do a strategy session with them is what do you want and by when? Mm -hmm. So be very, very specific about that. And why is that so important? Why is this specific? If I don't know what you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. I cannot give you the steps. I cannot give you a plan. I cannot lay out a plan for you. I, I won't be able to give you a clear strategy. Hey, mate, look, this these, you are trying to achieve $8,000 monthly passive income, right? Your income is this. Your equity is this right now. Or if you are just starting, you've got a deposit of this. These are the number of properties that we need. And this is how we're going to be able to do it. And can you share a little bit, I mean, how did you even get in this industry and, and why, why this industry of all other industries? That is such an amazing question that I really, really wanted to talk about. And I'm really glad that you asked this question that, number one, I come from a property family. Okay. My grandfather was a very successful developer, property developer. My father retired a few years ago uh, and he was a project manager in, in real estate. I got into finance first because when I was 18 years old, we were almost bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to learn money first because we were extremely rich and we were almost on the verge of bankruptcy. So I really wanted to understand what the heck happened. Um, the system is designed in a way that they're never going to be sharing the appropriate amount of financial education that we all need to be able to thrive is the right word. So. I really wanted to learn money first. And when I got to money, when I sold my businesses in 2021, all I really wanted to do is take some time off, which I did. And then I got bored. And I was like, you know what? I can't be sitting like this, just develop, just doing a, a couple of developments and sitting like this. So all I really wanted to do is just restart it again. So all I've ever actually done is, already done this before, and I just restarted it again in early 2023. That's it. And because I come from a real estate family, I just did not want to do anything else at all because I would say it's probably in my way. <laughs> it's, it's become a part of you. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, mate, I, I enjoy it. 
I've seen it that where we were and where I am and the amount of money that I've made through property is just it's just great. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. If, if we're being real for a second, your, your sure. service is a service. It costs money. It if does. If someone wants to engage you, they need to pay a fee. Correct. And, and I guess it's spread over different stages. Walk me through, why would that be an intelligent decision for someone that's looking to invest? Uh, I think it's a great question. On an average, we make bare minimum uh, anywhere from thirty-five dollars to $50,000 to our clients in the first year. Because okay. we buy properties where it's about to go crazy, not it's already been crazy. So you're talking about the growth. That, it's the growth, that, yeah. That a typical client would expect. Correct. In the first 12 months would generally be around thirty-five to 50000 Yep, and the, the sort of fee that they pay us, they get the the fee or the ROI on their fee in pretty much a few months. Okay. And sometimes w by the time we have gone unconditional to almost settlement, right? So we are working... On a deal uh, which is a commercial deal in South Australia mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get a longer settlement for the client so that we can work some development or we can get the approvals done as well this is a commercial property for almost 1.4 million dollars it's a great site it's a corner site very close to the city about 10 to 11 kilometers and we are asking for 12 months settlement and what we're basically going to do in those 12 months is all we really have to do is just to do a 10% deposit mm -hmm. and, and we're going to be basically lodging in the approval for the councils to be able to have two more warehouses on that site. So by the time they're going to actually settle the property, they're going to probably add bare minimum of three to four hundred thousand dollars to that particular property. And they're walking into equity. They are walking to equity straight away. Now, these are sort of the things that we do, not with just commercial development, but we obviously do to our residential clients as well and people who want to do development or people who want, to just, who want us to make them money. So essentially, we help you make money through property. It is obviously passive income, but the equity, the equity part as well, which we will be able to get you by the time sometimes you settle as well. So the ROI that they get on, on the fees that they pay us is just absolutely amazing. So do you even see the fee that they pay you as a cost or is that more of an investment? It's an investment. That's why you, the buyer's agent's fees are not tax deductible. It's not an expense. It's an investment because we obviously, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help you make money by the time you settle or in the first couple of years, you make a decent amount of money so that we can work together again and we can make you some more money. That's it. That's the whole point. And are you right? It's an investment. And uh, that's how the ATO sees it as well. You're mentioning in terms of the education, the, the lack of education, the financial education, you had to go out, you had to source that education Absolutely. for yourself. You learned it, you ended up going into the finance industry initially. I, I made a promise to myself, by the way, that if I want to do any job, it has to be, has to be banking. Okay has to be finance. I really, really want to understand what the hell happened. Because, and it doesn't apply most of the time, but it does apply 80% of the time. People in finance usually tend to make more money. And finance is the industry where most of the millionaires were created. The second one is, sorry, the first one is real estate. The second one is finance. Why? Because all they're doing is day in, day out is they're looking at money. Sure. And they're just getting smarter and smarter. So I really wanted to do that. I said, if I want to, we were, we were in trouble. Even though we were in trouble, I said, no, if I want to do something, it has to be finance. And then that's when I started working with Citibank USA. I worked with Barclays Bank UK. So I've, I've done a fair bit. And, then, and that's when I was like, you know what? It's time for me to go back to where I belong, which is property or real estate is what I enjoy the most. Thank you so much guys for tuning in for episode number one. Obviously we're going to be putting out a lot of clips out there. Uh, if you have any particular questions, please feel free to reach out to Nathan and myself. And uh, Nathan, do you want to tell us where can they reach out to you, please? Yeah. So you can find me uh, Nathan Massey on LinkedIn uh, or through our company page, Sprint Finance or our website, sprintfinance.com.au. Fantastic. Uh, guys, you can reach out to me 
on Instagram, property.strategist or Sovereign Property Investors. And we would love to really help you with whatever we can to make sure that you have an amazing portfolio so you can retire earlier. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Have an amazing day. See ya.